has two affiliates in the state, uh, Columbia Willamette and Southern Oregon, and I represent uh, the statewide uh, political arm of Planned Parenthood. Um, and as Michelle indicated, uh, we are on the front lines day in and day out, making sure um, that we are uh, promoting and defending legislation that impacts uh, women's health care and a woman's right to choose, um, and then also engage heavily um, on the electoral side. Um, I'd like to just start out tonight by sharing a quick story. Um, I knew that I wanted to work on the issue of choice since I was a little girl. And at the time that I told uh, my mom that, I grew up in, in Madison and then moved uh, to Colorado in a fairly, fairly liberal part of Colorado. Um, and I said that I wanted to work on the issue of choice and she all but patted me on the head. Uh, this is a woman who almost died uh, in the 60s in Madison, uh, self-aborting, and her mother almost died self-aborting. And she looked at me and she was like, oh, aren't you cute? These issues aren't gonna be relevant when you're a professional. And now here we are, and I talked to her last month, and she is floored, absolutely floored, that we are revisiting these same conversations that she and all of her friends and the generation before her thought that not only had they resolved, but had secured for us. And now we're having to spend our time and our energy protecting rights that we thought were already secure instead of advancing uh, for the next generation. So um, I, I, sort of a, a, a twist of fate uh, that I'm here and, and that these issues are more relevant than ever. Um, I'm, I'm pleased, but also a little, uh, it's a little bittersweet. Um, so just want to give you a sense of um, the magnitude of the way in which uh, um, decision making can impact um, our and, and um, negatively impact our uh, access uh, to health care. Um, being involved and, and keeping an eye on elections at all levels in the state is crucially important. Um, just today, I had to put out a fire, uh, proverbial fire, of course. Um, there's, we, uh, Planned Parenthood has an education department and we are um, helping um, high schools with high pregnancy rates and in low income districts uh, deliver a healthcare curriculum. A, a parent in one of our schools whose student is not in the class um, has been working a complaint through the system and is now asking for a hearing at the school board. And um, I contacted the school board, seven members. This uh, uh, man would need to get four of the school board members to agree to have a hearing, and a majority of them are with us. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, it was um, a good... A good reminder that is, as wonderful as it is to have a pro-choice uh, majority in Congress, uh, we're going to be working very hard to re-secure a pro-choice majority in the House in, in Oregon um, and hopefully increase our pro-choice majority in the Senate that really at all levels. Even more um, microscopic than that is uh, an issue going uh, happening in Ashland right now where a Catholic hospital wants to open a facility um, and and there there's going to be a forum um, next month to talk about whether or not it's going to be an actual Catholic hospital or Catholic Light, L-I-T-E. Um, the difference, obviously, being that if it is a full-fledged Catholic hospital, um, certain services wouldn't be able to be performed there. Even an independent physician um, who provides abortion services uh, could be denied admittance privileges uh, to this hospital in rural communities. That is huge, absolutely huge. So... Um, Again, you know, watching this at all levels, and so I would, you know, agree. I absolutely agree with Michelle. Please sign up, um, but also look for leadership opportunities in your own communities because all of a sudden, the Ashland Hospital Board has become the most important thing in my life on a dime, right? So, um, if you know anyone in Ashland, let me know. Um, so uh, certainly uh, helping support uh, current elected leaders and helping them get into office is crucially important. Um, and then holding them accountable once elected. Uh, we uh, Planned Parenthood, and in conjunction uh, with NARAL, will be working very closely and have been working very closely on uh, the governor's health care transformation work. Very pleased to tell you that there has been um, a carve out for a women's health domain, um, which includes preventative services. And that is um, crucial uh, to, to your point about uh, how important it is that those services are even on the radar, much less protected. Um, 
So to the ballot measures, uh, we are facing potentially two anti-choice ballot measures in Oregon uh, this campaign season. Uh, the first is a personhood amendment. It would be a constitutional amendment uh, protecting personhood, which is uh, assigning and ascribing um, rights to an unborn fetus um, and a fertilized egg, to be very clear. Um, and also a prohibition on uh, public funding um, of, of services, including abortion. Um, Oregon is one of only a handful of states uh, that still provides uh, benefit to, um, to women, and it is uh, a crucial component of our healthcare system. Um, so we will be fighting uh, that ballot measure vigorously. Uh, we will need um, all of you to help us. It's going to be an uphill battle, especially given all of the other electoral work uh, that we have in front of us. Um, but I know that with coalition partners like NARAL and ACLU, we will um, definitely give it everything we have. Um, look forward to taking questions from you later. Thank you so much. As somebody who has one of those state reps that sponsor that personhood thing, needless to say, we're working very hard to get rid of him. Anyway, um, I can say that. I didn't name his name. Um, and we actually have a man on our panel. Can you believe that? <laughs> We, we are not discriminatory that way, you see. Um, un and fortunately, he's a, a very special man. I, I knew and um, heard him when I first got involved with AU years ago. And then, I don't know whether I followed him or he followed me to, to Oregon. But um, anyway, um, Steve Green is uh, the Fred. I'm going to have to read this because he's got too much stuff, OK? Um, he's the Fred H. Paulus Professor of Law at Willamette Law School. He also holds a PhD in American constitutional history and a JD from the University of Texas. And you can see why he'd get out of there. But anyway, <laughs> main, main thing, <laughs> the main thing too, in addition to that, is that he served for 10 years as the legal director and special counsel for Americans United for Separation of Church and State and has participated in several cases before the Supreme Court. Um, yeah, we, you know, okay, he's worth it. <laughs> and, and also, he is the director at Willamette uh, of the Center for Religion, Law, and Democracy. He also serves on the Public Policy Board of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, and he's a well-published author. His latest book is The Bible, the School, and the Constitution, The Clash That Shaped Modern Church State um, doctrine, and it's at Oxford Press, and it's this year, 2012. Uh, Steve, do you have something to say? <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Uh, it's always good to speak to this crowd. It's nice to be in this kind of coalition group with these great organizations being represented here who do such good work, and so it's nice to see us all working together. Um, I think Bruce wisely asked me to speak last because he wanted me to talk about the law and People kind of start to tune out at that point in time or fall asleep. And um, so I, I know he said I have 15 minutes, but I think we probably want to get to questions. So I'll try to make this a little bit faster than that, just to kind of talk about a couple of the legal questions. Because conveniently, uh, 42 Catholic institutions, uh, universities, and dioceses have filed a lawsuit this last week, as you may have heard, to just rev up. The, the noise on this, so we know that there actually, this actually is uh, quite a current controversy going on. So I wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit and kind of put it in perspective. Um, initially, I want to try to respond to Erin's question, though, at least her, 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 it was a question more or less, why now? Why, why, why has this become so contentious now? And it's an interesting question. Uh, as she mentioned, uh, 28 states have, through their state legislation, have already imposed these type of restrictions, I should say restrictions, these type of provisions, these type of benefits uh, for employers, including religious employers. And there's always an exemption for churches and religious institutions that only um, hire their own people, that only minister to their own people, etc. And this is a very common type of exemption that exists. And this is actually what the new federal regulation tracks. Um, so this has been around for a while. In fact, California uh, imposed a uh, regulation like this back in the late 90s, more than about 15 years ago. 
Um, and, and many religious institutions have not objected to this. And so it is kind of interesting that this has come about now. Uh, I've been working on church state issues for 20 years, and I have noticed an increasingly conservative, if you could say more conservative, an increasingly conservative bent uh, to the U.S. Catholic Conference and also to just kind of some uh, Protestant fundamentalist groups. Uh, I don't know if they got emboldened by the previous Bush administration or whatever, but we are seeing kind of a radicalization that seems to be going on with, with many of these groups. And it's coming in conjunction with, again, something I think that Aaron mentioned about uh, charitable choice, the faith-based initiative, is that in conjunction with the kind of the opening up of participation or greater participation. I mean, religious organizations have been involved in charitable work for a long time and have been receiving public funds for a long time too. But they've always been very good about segregating the religious activities from the secular activities. And we actually have some representatives here from a couple of those organizations, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist and Ecumenical Ministries, who I think do it the right way and always have done it the right way and they're to be commended for that. But the Bush administration kind of confused these things and basically allowed for a blurring of these lines that have kind of kept separation of church and state protected. And as a result, we have seen a, uh, an increase in participation to a certain extent by some religious groups. And I think what's going on is that as we're seeing this, this greater privatization of social services throughout the country and religious groups are, are coming into the, into the mix a little bit more, they're wanting to come in with a certain type of protective bubble around themselves. They're wanting to say, we want a place at the table. We want a place at the trough. We want to be able to you know, participate and receive public funds. But we want to be able to be exempt from the necessary and important regulations that many times accompany these types of agreements to participate to work for the common wheel. And so they're wanting to have their cake and eat it too, to a certain extent. So I think that's one of the things that we are seeing as a result. And the, I think the Catholic Conference, and I have seen a transition. I actually was friend, somewhat of a friend, with the previous general counsel of the Catholic Conference when I worked back in Washington, D.C. back in the 1990s. And he has left. He was relatively moderate and has been replaced by someone who I also know who's actually quite a bit more conservative. And they're, they're kind of revving this up. And I think what they're seeing is and what they're, they're afraid of is that they see this issue here, and this is my own interpretation, I could be wrong. I think they see this issue here as kind of a line in the sand that they're wanting to throw down the gauntlet at this particular point in time because they are concerned, they realize that, that regulations are going to be continuing to increase and you can't expect that if you're receiving public funds or you're you know, participating in certain types of activities, that you can do that without adhering to certain types of regulations. And so I think as much as anything, why this is coming up now is notwithstanding the Catholic Church's longstanding position about uh, family planning questions, about abortion, about contraception, et cetera, that part's not new. But there has been the ability to pretty much compromise. And all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually the Catholic Conference is less and less willing to compromise because they are wanting to ensure that they're able to go forward with their religious program, but without having to, 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 to make any types of compromises. And to a certain extent, within a postmodern world we live in, this is becoming more and more and more artificial. This ability to, again, like kind of protect yourself with this protective bubble and to make this argument that anything that offends my religious sensibilities somehow now turns into what we might call a burden on my religious practice such that I should be exempt from that. And so that, that's kind of my analysis of what, what's going on. I want to talk real quickly about this question, though, about burdens on religion. And again, we have seen these new lawsuits. A friend of mine who teaches at Notre Dame, uh, through him I got a copy of the petition from Notre, uh, the, the complaint from Notre Dame, uh, about this lawsuit, and I think it's similar to the other ones that are going on. One thing I find actually very curious, and you may know more about this than I do, I haven't looked it up, is I'm not sure why the archdiocese are joining in this lawsuit because they are generally exempt from this because they are, re they are the core of this religious organization that is there. It's what this rule applies to, to the auxiliaries of religious organizations, which would not include most of the Catholic archdiocese. But anyway, it, it affects hospitals, it affects universities, etc. 
The nature of the claim, okay. Two questions are raised. One, is by virtue of now requiring, I guess you want to call it now, but anyway, requiring uh, religious institutions to provide through their insurance programs these types of services, does that constitute, one, a substantial burden on their religious practice? And two, even if it does, and this is the legalese, I apologize, the question is, still, does the government have a very important interest, maybe ensuring that we don't have discrimination against women, that we have full protected coverage, that that may override the burden that exists? Okay. Most of the arguments that I've heard, and I've heard coming from the administration, has been on the second one, of trying to kind of dance around why this is such an important thing. And it is an important thing. But I want to kind of go back to that first question. This is what I've noticed there's been kind of an absence, there's been a vacuum of discussion about this. The, the, and I'm not trying to pick solely on the U.S. Catholic Conference, but they're the lead of this. The U.S. Catholic Conference and other institutions have just thrown this down. This is a burden on our religion if our institutions have to provide for this type of insurance coverage. This has gone generally unquestioned. And according to what the complaint from, from Notre Dame says, it says, if we are required to pay for, provide, or facilitate services, or to sponsor coverage, that violates our deeply seated, sincerely held religious beliefs and practices of the Catholic Church, which they provide all this data in the complaint to prove this truly is Catholic doctrine. Okay. So the claim is it's inconsistent with Catholic doctrine, that they're coerced, to violate their rights of conscience. Now, we should all, as, as, as civil rights-oriented people, respect at least an, a, a, an affirmation, a claim, of a rights of conscience. We should be always concerned about rights of conscience that may exist. I mean, quite clearly, in the last administration, if someone, if the administration had said to me, the government, you must put a bumper sticker on your car that says, I support George Bush and Dick Cheney and the war in Iraq. I would say that's a violation of my rights of conscience, a violation of my free speech. And so to have to associate with certain types of ideologies and beliefs that you disagree with, that can be a violation of right of conscience. So let's not just dismiss it completely. But the point is, when we're talking about burdens of religion, mere inconsistency with some type of governmental practice does not necessarily rise to the level of a burden on religion. What's the harm here? And this is what I want to unpack this, this question. What is the harm here to, and here I'm talking primarily about the institutions. I fully recognize about burdens on religion on individuals and communities of believers, churches and those types of institutions. But if you think of a continuum, once we get further and further away from those kind of core institutions and individuals to these auxiliary related institutions, what's the nature of the burden here? What is the harm? I think the harm is kind of based upon some suppositions here. And the supposition is we are a religiously based entity and we have this sense that, we have this, this, this belief, this supposition that someone will be engaged in activity with which contradicts our religious beliefs, our religious doctrine, without necessarily really knowing I mean, the Catholic Church opposes abortion. The Catholic Church oppose, opposes contraception. Do they really know if any of their employees are actually utilizing those services? Well, there's something called the federal HIPAA law. And the federal HIPAA law basically says your employer doesn't get to know what you spend your insurance money on so far as the type of coverage, the type of prescription drugs you have, etc. This is protected information. It's supposed to be, yeah, I agree. So... In essence, the, the point here is, is that the burden on religion, possibly, I'm not saying this is the only way, but at least this has not even been talked about, is that the Catholic Church and other religious institutions have this fear, this sense that maybe something that they are doing by virtue of, as you said, not paying for it, not actually having to provide the services themselves, not dispensing the services, all they're doing is having it within an insurance coverage. And then what's the conscience burden? It is that possibly then someone may be, which I will never know, may be actually using the contraceptive care. 
it's, it's, it's interesting. There's a case that I was involved with many years ago down in California that was kind of similar to this. There was this very devout Presbyterian woman who owned an apartment building. And she swore on her husband's deathbed, this is true, I'm not exaggerating, that she would never do anything to promote homosexuality or fornication. And so she would never rent to gays, she would never rent to unmarried couples. And so a couple came and they wanted to rent her apartment and she looked at him, she goes, well, I think you may actually engage in sex and you're not married, so I'm going to refuse to rent to you. And so that violated the fair housing law in California. And so she claimed a free exercise defense. And her claim was something kind of similar. She didn't, maybe she had cameras in the bedroom, I don't know. But the thing is, she didn't know if they were doing something against her religious beliefs. She thought that maybe that was what was going on. Okay. Again, I'm not sure that the Catholic Church is coerced here into facilitating these types of things, which are against their deeply seated, I agree, deeply held religious beliefs. And you know what's ironic? It's probably one of the Catholic Church's greatest defenders on the United States Supreme Court, Justice Scalia, who was Catholic. Well, that's beside the point. He, in actually an opinion from 20 years ago, when he was talking about coercion, burdens on religion, and this was within, within the school prayer context. He disagreed with the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court held that there could be kind of ephemeral burdens on religion, on, on belief. He said, no, there's no such thing as a psychic burden on religion. You, when you're coerced, to, in order to get the claim, that coercion has to be, he, he said, no, I paraphrase, it was almost like, it needs to be like the Inquisition. It basically needs, it needs to force you to change your religious beliefs and practices. That's what it is. Basically, the thumb screws are on. And so it's kind of, I think it's very ironic that probably the U.S. Catholic Conference's greatest supporter, when it would come to questions about this, has already make, taken this stance that if you're going to say your religion is burdened, I want to see it really burdened. Psychic burdens are probably not enough. The second thing, and I, I'll, I'll try to sum up on this real quickly, is also to pick up on something that Aaron said, and I think this is actually an interesting point. And again, I'm not trying to make a definitive statement on this at this point in time. But when we are talking about conscience claims, about coercion, etc., I think it is important to somehow talk about distinctions between individuals and corporate entities. And maybe we're now living in the post-Citizens United world, where we believe that that corporations have all of the same rights and privileges that individuals do. I can understand, in fact, I do support conscience claims, and there's, there, there, there's a conscience clause which was introduced following Roe versus Wade. Ironically enough, do you know what the amendment was called? It's called the Church Amendment, anyway. Frank Church is the one who wrote this, okay. <laughs> the Church Amendment was passed in 1973 after Roe versus Wade in order to ensure that Catholic doctors, Catholic nurses, and then Catholic hospitals, because, only be, simply because they received some public funding, the Medicare, Medicaid, fund, Medicare, Medicaid funding, they did not have to perform abortions because it was against their religious beliefs. I actually do support, and you, some of you may disagree with me on this, but I actually do support that individuals of faith should not be forced to engage in medical activities with which violates their rights of religious conscience. And so I think doctors should be exempt from that. I actually think pharmacists who disagree with the dispensing of contraceptives, et cetera, should not be forced to do that, provided they're not the only pharmacist in town. I don't think the institutions should have the ability to opt out. But I do believe there should be conscience claims. Okay. Like I said, some of you may disagree with me. But I would like to distinguish that from institutions to a certain extent. Because I think the further you get away into these more auxiliary institutions, I'm not sure the, 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 the ability they have to actually raise a conscience claim. I did a really bad survey shortly before I came here. I looked up the board of directors of a couple of the religious hospitals here in Oregon. Okay. Um, they did not clearly delineate who was of that faith or who was not of that faith. But I'm noticing a couple of them, at least for what I saw, the number of people who were identified as being clergy was at an extreme minimal of the board of directors. Most of the board of directors were, in fact, hospital um, administrators, medical professionals, business leaders in the community, high donors, of course. Those are the people on the board of directors. Okay. You think about some of these institutions, Providence, St. Vincent, etc., who employ five, 6,000 individuals. 
the, that this institution itself has some type of burden on its religious conscience by virtue of the fact that someone is receiving coverage for a certain type of medical treatment. I mean, it's, it's so far removed from the core of some believers getting together and having, again, the thumbscrews put on them. I think we need to not necessarily assume that institutions have the same conscience claims as private individuals. And another reason why that is important, not just because I think they're distinctively different, is that when you accommodate people, individuals' conscience claims, normally it does not impose a burden on other individuals. The United States Supreme Court said many years ago, if we are going to allow for accommodations of religious practice, you need to show two things. One is you need to show there's a sincerely held religious belief that is being burdened. But second, you need to show that by virtue of accommodating your religious practice, you're not transferring the burden to someone else. And what happens within many of these institutional accommodations under the institutional conscience clauses is that they are transferring the burden. And again, I don't think the, 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 the religious burden is as great on these institutions. But then they're transferring the burden to other individuals, women who cannot receive the type of coverage with which they should be entitled to receive. And this becomes extremely problematic. My last point. This becomes extremely problematic. And this is something that I've been concerned about for a long time when we notice the consolidation of hospitals that have been going on in this nation for the last 20 years. Throughout the 1990s, approximately 130 consolidations occurred between Catholic hospitals and non-Catholic hospitals. And in every single instance, the Catholics tried, they weren't successful in every instance, tried to ensure that whatever coverage would be provided in these consolidations between public and private or private and Catholic would conform to Catholic doctrine. And so consequently, in many parts of the country, you have the only hospital that is available is an institution that does not provide certain types of services. And so within that type of context, we have a transferring of burdens, a, I think a relatively weak institutional burden onto a stronger individual burden who is unable to then uh, avail themselves of these very important services. Four out of the 10 largest hospital systems in the country are Catholics. 624 Catholic hospitals in the nation. And so this is a problem, I think, that we are all facing. And when we have that type of transferring of burdens onto individuals, I think we need to kind of go back and, again, unpack these claims about religious burdens and look at them without taking just as face value what the U.S. Catholic Conference and other religious fundamentalists and conservatives are saying about their burdens on religion. Thank you.